Okay. Um, I, thought, I think that was a really good wrap up of um, uh, what happens in relapse at the moment. It was pretty succinct but gave a lot of options. Um, can we start with any first questions? There, has anybody got any questions here in the audience? Um, hi there. Um, I've had a question for Liz. There was something you said around um, just temozolomide, um, for like frequency of taking that. And you talked about five days on, 23 days off. Um, and I was curious to know why, or it, let's, let's say I'm actually taking a, a daily dose currently. I'm just wondering why the difference, like what, what, might, um, what might drive that? It's, it's a good question. And the, interestingly, I've heard that the five-day schedule was based on the original animal studies. So there, were, there was a big beagle dog study <laughs> and it was five days on, 23 days off and it worked and it happened to be what was chosen for uh, the adjuvant approach um, after the concurrent, which is – so it's given – so just for people – it's given continuously during the radiation. So seven days continuously for, for six weeks, if it's a six-week course, for four weeks, if it's a four-week course, every day. Um, interestingly, there's also a guy in America called Mike Shenouda who looked at starting temozolomide even earlier than radiation. Um, so that's a, that's a question that we're looking at in the MAGMA study. So that's all continuous. That's every single day. And that's a lower dose. Uh, but based on the original phase one and phase two, the five-day schedule persisted. And, um, and that was the STUP study. So after the concurrent chemo, chemo radiation, there was four weeks off and then started this six-day cycle of five days on, 23 days off. The... Um, Americans, including the Canadians, tend to give it for a year. The Europeans still stick to the original study, which is six cycles. Um, and the MAGMA study, which I've already alluded to, its second question is six cycles versus indefinite, just going on. And the concern about giving it indefinitely is will you breed resistance um, in, in, in the tumour cells? Uh, so I don't think there's a huge amount of magic or science that went into that original fi five-day thing. It was how it started. But what's happened subsequently is there have been studies looking at um, metronomic versus five-day and it hasn't shown a survival benefit. Um, there's also been studies looking at 12 months versus six months hasn't shown a survival benefit. So the five-day as the classic adjuvant has persisted and that's how it's bottled. All the bottles come with five capsules. That's how you know all, all the repeats are, are sort of worked out. Um, but as I alluded to in the relapse setting, some patients it makes a difference instead of giving the five days on, 23 days off. If you tweak that and make it more continuous, whether it's three weeks on, one week off or actually continuous sometimes can stop a, a relapse going, um, you know, full steam ahead and can slow it down in certain patients. Uh, sometimes we use drugs in the medical oncology setting and it can take 20, 30 years to use it properly. There's a drug called 5-FU and it, you know, 20, 30 years down the track, there's still question marks about how best to use it. But I think we'll be stuck with a five-day adjuvant schedule for some time. Thanks for the question. Okay. So just to clarify, adjuvants after oh, radiation. Yes. So yeah. adjuvant is so yeah. The concurrent um, is with the radiation. Uh, as I said, for whether it's a short course or a long course, then there's four weeks off, and then adjuvant is the the bit that comes after the definitive treatment of surgery and chemo radiation. The word adjuvant has got its naysayers in, in that. The, classically in other oncology settings, adjuvant is for microscopic disease. So like let's say there's a breast lump and you take that out and there's nothing to see and then you give adjuvant chemotherapy to minimise the chance of it coming back. Often we don't have the luxury in this setting to have a scan that's completely clear. So it's sometimes not just microscopic disease we're treating but overt measurable disease that we can see on the scan. So I do have some colleagues that really resent the word adjuvant in this setting. Okay. Um, there was just an online question. Uh, are there any early indicators of relapse or return of tumours? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the, one of the key factors we look for um, 
is well, is patient symptoms, but probably one of the key indicators might be an out of the blue seizure. Now, a seizure can occur from any irritation in the brain. Um, it can occur from people who have had um, inflammation in the brain, such as the uh, post-treatment effects. But if patients have been stable and then there's a seizure, then we tend to follow those people more closely with uh, earlier MRIs and earlier interval MRIs as well. So if someone's on six monthly follow-up with MRIs and then a seizure happens, the MRI might still look clear, but then we bring them back for another early uh, scan. So seizure, uh, a lot of the times we're now picking up disease based on MRIs. Uh, so we see progression of tumor when an MRI is undertaken rather than when a patient's getting new neurological deficits. Yes, I agree with Michael. And sometimes it can be really subtle. Um, I've got a few patients in the room and I know that I, I grill them with lots of physical assessments, including, you know, ca mathematical calculations and months of the year backwards and walking heel to toe and this, that and the other. And sometimes there's just something subtle that's a bit different. And if it if that continues to get worse, you kind of go, let's bring that MRI forward. You know, if you're suddenly sort of dragging the foot a little bit. So it's it can be an obvious neurological change or an obvious thing like a seizure, but sometimes it can be r something really subtle in that clinic room that gives us a hint that maybe we need to bring the MRI forward. Thank you. So another question uh, from online. Um, is there any disadvantage of repeat craniotomy by a different surgeon. <laughs> Advantage or disadvantage? Yeah, well, um, I, I think usually not. I, I guess there's different, you know, like anything in, in life, there's different um, levels of experience and exposure. And um, But most of the technology that we use is widely available. Um, the, you know, training process, etc., is fairly universal. Um, is there an advantage of having a different set of eyes looking over things? Maybe. I don't really know. Um, but there's certainly advantages in familiarity and uh, as well. So I think it's, um, you know, I don't think there's a clear answer to that, that question. But um, there's certainly, um, you know, it's everyone's right to kind of get opinions and, and that sort of thing. So um, I don't think clearly we could, uh, we can say one way or another. I think sticking on that, I, I think most places now have a 3T MRI scan, but another question was around a 2T MRI scanner and, you know, whether this is good enough for surgery. But I think most places in Australia now have 3T, don't they? Yeah, most have 3T, yeah. but 1.5T is, um, yeah, yeah. It, it is good enough for the questions that we need to ask ourselves beforehand. Um, but again, there's all the other modalities are sort of starting to have more of a role, like PET scans, mm. um, some of the spectroscopy stuff, all these sorts of things, particularly diffuse tumours where we might be doing only a biopsy, um, working out where the best part of the tumour to biopsy is and where to get the most information from. Some of the other um, scan modalities can have a role as well. Okay. Are there any other questions from the room? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, my husband has a glioblastoma uh, nine months ago and he is currently having a lot of speech issues. Intermittent aphasia, they're calling it, and he's on dexamethasone. And every time I mention that to the different oncologists, they all go, how long has he been on that for? Like, how long should he be on it? What dose? <laughs> Look, I, 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 we try not to get into sort of in individual cases. Um, look, some patients are on dexamethasone for their entire journey. So there are some patients that it's in, almost impossible to wean and when you get, say, below two milligrams, you know, the, the symptoms come back, you know, whether it's loss of speech or something else that, that really affects quality of life. So I can certainly think of a significant number of patients where the dexamethasone has been part of the entire journey. Um, so if the dexamethasone can't be reduced, that's when it might be worthwhile asking the oncologist, is there a role for bevacizumab? 
um, or Mvasi, that's the, the, the new generic um, brand name of it. Uh, so, uh, but, um, so the main side effects of dexamethasone we've, we've mentioned, you know, so you can get, get weakness of your thighs and your arms and high sugars and so forth. So it's always important to keep the dexamethasone dose as low as possible. But, um, you, you know, your husband's not alone. There are plenty of patients who have dexamethasone as part of their protocol all the way through. Uh, I might add to that too if I can. So I guess a lot of this decision-making, we talk about different treatment options. It, it's all about relative risk, you know. So, for example, um, we often find ourselves in the situation where someone has um, what looks like progression or, or could be pseudo-progression treatment effect on scans. And we have to make the decision about whether we start adding a va Avastin to the treatment or it's redo craniotomy. And, and there's pros and cons of each of those treatments that's very, very individualized. So something like being on dexamethasone, for example, yes, there's some side effects of it, um, but there's also some benefits as well. This is where I think, and again, I think it's great that, that Liz is here today, just obviously Michael and I work together but we have a, a multidisciplinary group, not only across our unit, but um, we're quite a small community in, in your oncology and we talk to each other all the time and, and get opinions from one another all the time. But that's where it really comes down to us speaking and working out, you know, what the, what the best treatments are or what the safest treatment is, that best compromise between risk and effectiveness for each individual and it does change from, from person to person so that's why we you know we find it hard sometimes to relate our answers to these questions to what might be appropriate for your husband or anyone else's loved one in the room. And some patients can't tolerate dexamethasone if it affects their mood too much or you know etc so it, it, it really it's very individualized there's no answer that fits everybody. Just on to that, um, there was another question about is there an alternative to dexamethasone other than Avastin? Uh, look, it's, it's the holy grail. <laughs> um, been, there has been a little bit of effort um, and some studies um, over the last 20 years looking at dexamethasone alternatives. Uh, Bevacizumab, which is intravenous, is the best we've got at the moment and other drugs have been somewhat disappointing. Uh, but look, there definitely are, are you know research units around the world looking at looking at this question. Uh, but at the moment, it probably still is the, if not gold standard, the bronze standard that we live with. Um, you know, a friend and our foe. Surgery. Um, no, <laughs> well, I mean, I say it jokingly, but sometimes. Yes. Sometimes that's exactly right. Yeah, we do think about, well, if you're going to need to be on dexamethasone for a month, three months, six months, that has long-term side effects as well. And yes, surgery is dangerous. There are risks. There are things that can go wrong. But um, but maybe you're better off taking all that risk up front rather than saying the, the potential risk of being on dexamethasone, um, bevacizumab, some of the second line chemo agents so again it's really subtle isn't it like you can you get you can tell that we need to you know we, we talk about this stuff all the time and the judgment often comes down to mobility so if people are mobile they'll end up uh, enjoying life better and living longer so dexamethasone when it you start to lose the muscle bulk off the thighs and you start putting on weight around your girth, then your mobility is affected, and that's really the signals we you want to be getting in before that gets too bad. Because when mobility gets affected, it's then hard to regather that. So there was just one more comment about the Avastin um, being a drug of last resort, which we do hear quite a lot. So can we make a comment on that? Look, I... I I don't necessarily think of it as a last resort. I think you use it when you need to use it. So I've used it in a couple of patients. I can think of one patient who was a high-flying sort of finance CEO. He was st he was starting Stuck Protocol a few weeks in and he had so much swelling. During that initial treatment, I remember on, on Christmas Eve, I started him on Pevacizumab. It was like, you know, and I saw him in clinic and thought he doesn't, this high flying guy is not using his phone properly. Uh, you know, he's really, obviously, there's just a lot of swelling happening. So you use it, you know, we don't 
keep it in the drawer if we if if we need to use it. Uh, but I think we have also learned that if there's a small nodule and there's no swelling around it there's probably no point in throwing it at everybody up front. We've got no hard and fast um, evidence that it improves survival, but in some patients it can be really important functionally and to maintain that independence. And as Michael alluded to, it's got some new uses in terms of re-irradiation and, and preventing um, or minimising radionecrosis. Uh, there was a bit of a fear that if you stop bevacizumab, uh, you'll get rebound swelling or rebound edema. So we here in Australia through Cogno, the, um, the research body, um, did a study uh, looking at continuing bevacizumab or stopping bevacizumab if the tumour got worse on the bevacizumab. And there wasn't a clear-cut um, danger in stopping the bevacizumab, but still anecdotally you hear people say, if I stop the bevacizumab, there's going to be rebound sort of swelling. And so a lot of people do. Once you start it, you continue it. And it's a, it's a commitment, you know, it, it, often every two or three weeks intravenously. So I think we use it judiciously, but I think last resort, you know, if we need to use it sooner, we certainly will have no hesitation in doing so. Yeah. Um, strictly speaking, we're, a lot of us are being a bit naughty in that, um, you know, I did, the wording does imply it should be used as monotherapy, so by itself, but based on some of that European data, some of us do use it with lomustine, which I think we get away with because lomustine is not really on the PBS, so it's something that... Uh, it's not that easy to audit us. <laughs> but uh, And I suppose it's on the PBS, um, you know, after all the studies were it, done. And it took 15 years to get onto the PBS. Yeah. yeah, and it was through a lot of, you know, groups like BTAA, the Brain Cancer Group patients, pushing and pushing and lobbying government to actually get it. And it, I think it is on the PBS for as a supportive care. It definitely is, yeah. which is great make one more comment uh, and I don't think anyone said this directly today but but bevacizumab significantly puts up the risk of surgery subsequent to having been on bevacizumab yeah so um, just making sure that we we know that like that's important that's an important factor if we if you know later on down the track we say well you, you can't have any more surgery um, uh, that, that that's sort of an under, understanding we all have yeah, so I think I said, because I talked about when the, the risk of the wound breaking down. So if surgery's just happened or if surgery's planned, we definitely stay away from the bevacizumab. And the other thing is, is that some clinical trials don't allow you to be on bevacizumab or to have had bevacizumab. So you've just got to be careful when you're looking ahead. We're often kind of going, what's next for this patient? So you've got to take all, you know, so if you're interested in a particular trial for a patient and that's and bevacizumab is not allowed, you might hold back on the bevacizumab just to keep as many options open as possible. And as Jonathan said, if surgery is still a possibility, that's a really important option. So we'll be very um, careful before we use bevacizumab and, and involve the surgeons in that conversation. Okay, just to go off on to a different uh, area, there's a question online about is gamma knife surgery available in Australia? So uh, gamma knife is stereotactic radio surgery. And most departments around Australasia will use stereotactic radio surgery. So I can deliver stereotactic radio surgery at um, multiple hospitals, and most radiation oncologists who are managing people with brain tumors will have access to a stereotactic radio surgery program. So stereotactic radio surgery is delivered on a machine like the ones we showed. Gamma Knife is a specific uh, unit which delivers stereotactic radio surgery. Uh, using radioactive sources, but it's the same, relatively the same dose to the patient, same treatment technique. Uh, New South Wales is a gamma knife unit in Macquarie University Hospital, and there's one in Queensland as well. But there's no data which suggests a superiority of gamma knife treatment over linear accelerator based stereotactic radio surgery for malignant lesions. If you've got Parkinson's disease uh, or you've got other benign conditions where you want to destroy a small area of the brain, then gamma knife procedures are probably safer than using a standard stereotactic radiotherapy, radiosurgery set up on an accelerator. But those indications are not 
cancer related and they're also uh, quite unusual and should be only in very specialized units anyway. Uh, so the other technology that's going to come through is proton therapy and that will be in uh, Adelaide in 2025 and that's a, it'll be the first proton unit in Australia and that may have some role in reducing the dose to normal brain in certain conditions of brain tumors. But around the world there's not much proton data available for gliomas and the approaches probably show not a lot of advantages and potentially some inherent disadvantages of using proton because the sometimes you need that dose going to the surrounding brain where the tumor is infiltrating. So there's still a lot of work to be done on that. Above all, I think the most important thing that comes out of defining radiotherapy approaches is not the machine, but it's actually more the target volume delineation. Knowing, trying to get a good understanding of where the tumor is on the MRI, where it is if you've got available PET scans, and trying to map out the tumor in the modern era is far more important than the actual machine it's being delivered on. Most machines in Australia are really well calibrated, safe, and most of them now come with all the advanced tools which, are, which were new in 2010, 2015, they're now all standard on most linear accelerators coming through. So it's really that we've got to go back to the target volume delineation and working out where these tumors are and getting the information from the surgeons, really deep diving into those MRIs and getting information where relevant in PET scans and also trying to work out from all of our patients that have been treated previously where these tumors end up. So it's not just growing like that, the tumors might extend along major white matter tracks and therefore targeting those areas is probably more important than the machines which are delivering it. Okay, I think we'll just have one more question and then we'll wrap up for some morning tea. Um, so the final question today is around relapse for grade three anaplastic meningiomas and what's the preferred, I think, first line or court first protocol for meningioma relapse? So. So for uh, meningiomas uh, and grade three, so malignant meningiomas, um, you really need to work out where it's relapsing. So it's, it may involve another surgical approach. Um, if the patient's previously had radiotherapy and surgery, then if the tumor is localized when they're relapsing. We've now got a, a really effective PET scan called a dotatate PET scan, which allows you to map out areas which look like a bit of thickening on the lining of the brain, which may be just scar tissue or it could be meningioma, that allows you to be more specific. If it's just in one region, then we encourage a further operation. But if it's in multiple regions, that's when roles such as re-radiation comes in. Or there are novel agents coming through, such as uh, radioisotope therapy with lutate. And lutate is a uh, targeted treatment where you put a small bit of radiation onto a radioisotope, which is the same as a diagnostic scan, the PET scan, and it takes that radiation straight to where the tumor is. And that data is emerging at the moment. It's not Medicare funded, but it's potentially showing some roles in slowing tumors down. There is also good data coming through, but not established data yet on, believe it or not, Avastin, uh, which shows it may have a role, and also specific targeted therapies that we've been using for lung cancer may affect uh, the same proteins that are, are activating meningioma growth. So they're being used as well. But unfortunately, we've not got a lot of uh, established chemotherapy or targeted drugs as yet for recurrent meningioma. And it's really the main role is mapping out where the tumor is coming back and dealing with it locally. Okay, I think we'll just take one question from the floor and then we'll go to morning tea. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll try and keep this quick. Um, questions for uh, Dr. Parkinson, actually. Um, Professor, I hope you get past today. Um, <clears throat> so my first surgery was 20 years ago, 03. Um, had a couple between 09 and 13. And really noticed the technical difference between the, the first one and the, the next two. Um, so that's almost 10 years ago as well, now for me. So 
what have you seen in the last 10 years? What do you expect to see in the next 10? Yeah, I guess that's um, a hard question. I think it's a, a bit like um, Michael was saying with reference to radiation, um, you know, treatments and, and machines and availability, it's all fairly um, all fairly standardised now. There's a couple of adjuncts that we use. Obviously, I, I showed the microscope, I showed the stereotaxy in my talk. There's a, a thing called 5ALA, which is where we... Um, where we, you get a dye that fluoresces under the microscope, that can be helpful. Um, that can certainly lead to more extensive resections, whether or not that, that's of benefit or not is where the, the point of argument um, lies. We do a lot of surgery awake, looking particularly when it um, gets towards more functional areas of the brain, trying to preserve function uh, over necessarily removing all of the tumour. All of those things are, you know, relatively commonplace now. What does the future hold? I guess it's just um, it, improvements on that technique. Maybe there'll be some more. We're seeing the imaging side evolve particularly, and that's obviously something we're ac very active in the brain cancer group with our brain cancer imaging laboratory. We're looking at different forms of imaging and how that might um, help us diagnose tumors initially but also um, progression as we've talked about this morning but uh, and how that can some of that technology may well be applicable into the um, into into the operating theater the hardest part with surgery is is being certain that what we're looking at is tumor versus what's normal brain and working out the boundaries of where we're able to remove but not um, remove the tissue but not affect function. And so probably that's going to be the area where the, as the technology improves there and we can improve the safety of surgery even further um, that it may, you know, there'll be more advantages of surgery over some of these other treatments. And again, back to that risk-reward risk thing we were sort of talking about earlier. Okay. All right, that'll wrap up the morning session. Uh, morning teas up the back of the room. Uh, help yourself to that. And, of course, the bathrooms are out in the foyer of North Shore Private Hospital. We'll come back at about 11.40 for session two. Thank you.